excited to be introducing Reverend Dr. Nikima Levy Pounds. She is a civil rights attorney, freedom fighter, legal scholar, blogger, and nationally recognized expert on issues at the intersections of race, public policy, economic justice, public education, juvenile justice, and the criminal justice system. She is the author of several articles and essays focused on racial justice, poverty, incarceration, and the war on drugs. Her work has been featured in the Associated Press, The Crisis Magazine, Huffington Post, and The Star Tribune, just to name a few. She has appeared on national news outlets such as CNN, PBS, Al Jazeera America, News One, and HuffPost Live. And currently, she's the co-owner and co-founder of Black Pearl LLC, a multifaceted company that provides business consulting, talent management, and media management services. In 2016, she received the Distinguished Service Award from the Governor's Commission on Martin Luther King Day. In 2015, she was named one of the 40 under 40 by Minneapolis St. Paul Business Journal. In 2014, she was named a Minnesota Attorney of the Year by Minnesota Lawyer and recognized as one of the 50 under 50 most influential law professors of color in the country by Lawyers of Color magazine. She formerly served as a law professor at the University of St. Thomas Law School for 13 years as president of the Minneapolis NAACP and as an advisor to Black Lives Matter Minneapolis. And most recently, she has announced her candidacy for mayor of the city of Minneapolis. Now let's welcome Nikima Levy Pounds. Hi, everyone. How are you all doing out there today? Let's give it up for our allies. It's really powerful to see so many people here to support our Muslim brothers and sisters. I just want to share a few words as an ally to the Muslim community that I hope will inspire us all to take things to the next level. We know that we're living in tumultuous times. We know that negative messages are being sent from Washington, D.C. to other parts of the country to right here in the state of Minnesota about our Muslim brothers and sisters. And it's very easy when you are constantly being bombarded with negative messaging about a certain group of people to internalize that messaging, even without your consent. So many times we pick up the newspaper, or we watch the, the nightly news, and we're seeing mug shots of our Muslim brothers and sisters. We're hearing negative stories about terrorism. And before you know it, you can get into a place where you begin to stereotype people that you don't even know, where they haven't even had a chance to demonstrate who they are, the content of their character, or the ways in which they positively contribute to our society. See, I can relate to that. I am a Christian woman, but I'm also African-American. In the context of being African-American, I understand what it's like to experience discrimination and to have those stories and tales of discrimination be disregarded and to have people pretend as though these things aren't happening to tell us that we're living in a post-racial society. Well, we know full well that that is not the truth. As an African-American woman, I know what it's like to be stereotyped. Because when I'm walking into stores, people don't see my credentials. They don't see that I have a law degree. They don't see the accomplishments and the accolades. What typically they see is dark skin and all of the negative attributes that are attributed to dark skinned people within this country. Those negative attributes did not just appear out of nowhere. They're a part of a 400 plus year 400 plus years of a legacy of discrimination. So it's important for us to understand that when we're talking about the Muslim community, we are talking about a perpetuation of some of the stereotypes and the discrimination that's been going on for a very long time in this country. Now, rather than be 
<laughs> Thank you. I, I forgot I'm also a preacher, so the call and response, I'm like, praise God. <laughs> so one of the ways that I'm looking at the current situation and um, some of the things that Donald Trump is doing in office is that not only am I frustrated by what's happening, not only am I mad some of the days about what's happening, but I also am excited by the opportunity that each of us have been given to rise up against injustice, to rise up against oppression, to rise up against discrimination. We're in a place right now where we have some decisions to make. Either we can sit back and we can remain complacent in the face of adversity and opposition, or we can do something about the negative things that we're seeing happening in our society. The reality is that the discrimination that we've seen at the hands of the Trump administration did not just begin in January when this man took office. This has been going on for a very, very, very long time. Even the term Islamophobia, that was coined in about 1991. So this has been going on far longer than we should have tolerated. And part of the reason why it's been going on is because too many of us have been complacent in the face of adversity. Too many of us have sat back comfortably, focusing on ourselves, focusing on our families, and of course there's nothing wrong with that. But when will we get to the point where we begin to focus on our neighbor and not just see our neighbor as the other, but to understand that we are a part of our neighbors, regardless of race, regardless of gender, regardless of sexual orientation, regardless of religion, regardless of whether our neighbor is able or disabled, rich or poor, they are a part of us. And so that means that we have to begin to be concerned about our neighbors and to love our neighbors as we love ourselves. If we can begin to think about our neighbors in that way, it becomes very difficult to see our neighbors as the other. It will be difficult to go into all white workplaces in 2017 and to feel comfortable you will look around and say, wait a minute, where's my neighbor? Especially if you live in the Twin Cities, that's much more diverse than other parts of Minnesota. So there's no excuse for not allowing our neighbors into our workplaces. There's no excuse for allowing our neighbors into the schools that many of our children have the privilege to attend. And often, the quality of the school that someone attends is based upon their socioeconomic status. It's a problem when we're relegating poor black and brown people to, into a school system that is not adequately educating them and allowing them the opportunity to be a part of mainstream society and to enjoy access to opportunity that many of us who have a college degree and beyond are able to enjoy. Something's wrong with that picture. We're not gonna be comfortable. We're just not. We're not going to be comfortable if some of us call ourselves Christians, but the only people that we know are other Christians. We have to get outside of our comfort zones and, and recognize the humanity within all people. And if we don't understand someone's religious practices, we need to get to know them and we need to, to take time to understand so that we're not walking around ignorant and lacking knowledge because so much of the hatred that goes on in society feeds off of our ignorance. There are a lot of people who are prejudiced, not necessarily because they're intentionally prejudiced, because they've learned to be prejudiced, they've learned to fear. And just like you can learn something, you can unlearn something. If your mind is made up that that's what you want to do. And now, with some of the things happening in Washington, we talk a lot about Minneapolis, for example, becoming a sanctuary city along with St. Paul. And I think that that's noble. And I think that that's important to provide refuge and to make sure that our immigrant brothers and sisters, our Muslim brothers and sisters who come from other countries are protected 
under the law, that we're safeguarding them. But I also believe that being a sanctuary city means making sure that our immigrant brothers and sisters, our Muslim brothers and sisters, the poor people in our community have adequate access to economic opportunity. That's how you provide true sanctuary. Where if someone needs access to affordable housing, they can, they can go and find somewhere decent to live and not have to be on the streets and not have to be in a shelter. For many of our immigrant brothers and sisters, they're living in unsanitary conditions inside of buildings that have not been properly regulated. And so many are afraid to talk about the conditions and to report the conditions. Why? Because their landlords threaten to report their immigration status. That's unacceptable. It should be unacceptable in the city of Minneapolis and the city of St. Paul. And if we're a sanctuary city, we would not tolerate that. We would not tolerate that. If we're a true sanctuary city, when we see op-eds written in the Star Tribune or the Pioneer Press or racist comments in the Star Tribune, which we know, happens quite frequently. When I used to be a blogger for the Star Tribune, I did not read the comments when I wrote about equity. Because I said, I'm not writing for cowards behind a computer screen. I'm writing for those who want to know the truth about justice and equity and fairness and equality. So when we're reading some of those negative op-eds, those bias op-eds, those prejudice op-eds, we need to be willing to use our voices to fight back and challenge some of the ignorance that comes forward. Some of the Pew studies that have come out talk about the fact that when you know a Muslim person, you are twice as likely to see them as being positive as opposed to, again, the ignorance of not knowing, causing people to fear. So that means that many of our churches, that means many of our synagogues have to get outside of their comfort zones, hosting events with our Muslim brothers and sisters, learning about their religious practices. And in the workplace, if we work alongside Muslim brothers and sisters and they're facing discrimination because they want to go pray, we shouldn't just sit comfortably by and allow that to happen. We need to learn to use our privilege to speak up. And yes, there are consequences when you use your privilege to speak up. I know firsthand after the Mall of America demonstration, after helping to shut down I-94, facing criminal charges and all that, that there are consequences when you stand up for justice. But the consequences of being silent in the face of injustice are far worse. <clears throat> So we have an opportunity here in the state of Minnesota to practice true allyship. And that's what gets me excited about the times that we're living in. It's an opportunity to rise up. We've seen it before throughout our history. Think about the people during the 1950s and 60s who rose up against the Jim Crow laws, against segregation, against racism and oppression. They were ordinary citizens just like you and me who were tired of what was happening to them. And allies were tired of seeing their African-American brothers and sisters being discriminated against. Not only during that period of time did we see the rise of Rosa Parks, did we see the rise of Dr. King, did we see the rise of children standing up and fighting against injustice, but we also saw the rise of Malcolm X, who was a black Muslim who used his faith to combat injustice. And a lot of people see Malcolm X as a controversial figure, and in many ways, he was. But after he was converted to the true meaning of Islam, he became a powerhouse that wanted to unite all people, all people across different racial and ethnic backgrounds. Now, when I got to Minnesota in 2003, one of the things that was interesting to me about this environment was how positive it was. 
Okay, so I, when I was recruited to teach at St. Thomas Law School, I was told, you know, this is a wonderful place to raise your family. Our distressed communities aren't so distressed. You know, this is a land of opportunity, and in many ways, it absolutely was. I, I, I love the state of Minnesota because there are so many wonderful attributes. But a couple of years into my time here, I put down the mainstream newspapers and I started picking up that local African-American newspapers and I saw a completely different side of the story. I saw stories about police abuse. I saw stories about mass incarceration and how it was impacting poor communities of color. I, I saw stories about educational disparities, income disparities, I mean homelessness disparities, the list goes on and on. And I said to myself, I have to do more than just sit in the ivory tower of academia as these problems are happening. And I didn't know where to start. I didn't know where to start. In one of the articles I had read about an African-American man who at the time was the president of the St. Paul NAACP. And I just picked up the phone and I called him. And I said, you know, you don't know me, I'm a law professor at St. Thomas, but I, I know that you're active in the field of civil rights. I want to know what's going on in the African-American community. And so he agreed to meet with me. We sat down and talked for four hours. At the end of that four hours, as he recounted story after story after story of some of the abuses that were happening in the community, I said, I want to start a civil rights legal clinic that begins to address these issues. And I've been off and running ever since. That man was African-American. <laughs> but he was also Muslim. So he held a dual identity because he not only had to experience decades of uh, discrimination in the Rondo area of St. Paul, where he saw I-94 destroy that community, where his own grandfather had to be dragged out of his house because he refused to move, but he faced harassment as well because of his identity as a Muslim. That's something that we don't often think about, the intersectionality between movements and, and how in one person you can face multiple types of discrimination. And so my eyes were open through that experience of sitting down with a black Muslim man and hearing about the pain, the legacy of the uh, injustices that were happening in the community but also seeing his resolve to persevere even when people didn't want to listen to what he had to say. And he passed that spirit of defiance against oppression to me. And I was able to pass that along to my students. Many of my students, when I was at St. Thomas Law School, were white, middle class, often from rural backgrounds, often had not had direct conversations about racial discrimination or religious discrimination. But I said, since you signed up and you applied, I can work with that. I can work with a willing heart. So as an ally, it doesn't matter from what place we start. We could have come from families that spoke negatively about people from different religious groups or, or families who have a history of discriminating against people of color. You don't have control of what your family's legacy was or some of the biases that you may have been taught or inherited. But you do have control of what you do now with what you know. And that's the opportunity that is here for all of us. Again, to decide that we are going to get off the sidelines and we're going to become engaged. So many people that are in this room have to recognize the power that you have when you pick up the phone and you call your elected official and you demand that they make changes under the law. That you, when you demand that they bring forward bills that CARE, for example, is saying need to be championed. When you show up at the legislature and pack those hearing rooms and sign up to testify, they will be blown away by the power of the people to stand up against oppression. Those are the kinds of movements that we're able to launch. When we pack city hall chambers and saying, we want this change under the law. We want to see these ordinances enacted. We want to see people being treated with dignity and respect. You will be amazed how political leaders respond to the voices of their constituents. 
So think about that power that you hold and don't take it for granted. Don't allow people to just come and knock on your door and say, vote for me. And they can't tell you anything about what they plan to do for the marginalized, for people who are facing religious persecution, for people who are on the fringes of society due to homelessness, economic opportunity. If they can't tell you those things, then they have not earned your vote. They haven't. And we have to begin to hold them accountable because they're the ones who are casting votes that are going to change the laws that govern us and that govern our Muslim brothers and sisters. In addition to thinking about the power of the polls, I mentioned earlier about using the power of the pen and writing our own op-eds and being proactive. We don't have to wait for a crisis to come down through the Trump administration, because we already know that's going to happen. OK, let's just get that in our minds right now. That's the new normal, but we don't have to tolerate the new normal. We can begin to pick up a pen when we see current injustices and begin to write about them. When we're in our homes, when we're around our neighbors, and we're hearing whispers of things that feel like racism or xenophobia or Islamophobia, we have a chance in those moments to not just be Minnesota nice and smile and nod your head, even if it makes you uncomfortable, but to, and you guys see, I'm not Minnesota nice, I'm LA nice, so I'm just <laughs> direct, okay? What you see is what you get, and I'm okay with that. But we have a chance to not just sit back and allow those conversations to take place. We can challenge those conversations. And we don't have to be confrontational or combative about it. We can merely ask questions, well, why do you believe that? Or what did you read that made you think that? Or do you even know any Muslim people? And then challenge them to get out and meet some people from a different background to open up the eyes of their understanding so that they realize that that person wearing a hijab is still their brother or their sister. And that doesn't dictate the quality of their humanity. So with all of us having this opportunity today, we've taken in so much and it's been beautiful hearing speaker after speaker, seeing the wonderful young people out here dancing, hearing the comedian as well, all of these things are opening up our minds to understand that we have a responsibility, which again, I see as a blessing. It is an opportunity to do what we've seen in previous decades, where people said enough is enough, I'm not gonna sit back and allow these things to happen, I'm going to get involved and I'm going to get personally involved. I'm going to make a difference. I'm going to meet my neighbor. I'm going to love my neighbor as I love myself. And if we can do that, then we will become the change that we want to see in this world, which Gandhi spoke so eloquently about. Thank you all for being here. <laughs> Blessings to you. I look forward to seeing you on the front lines fighting for change. Nakima, love you pounds, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you so much, Nakima.